Hello, everyone. First, I'd like to say thank you and acknowledge that we are gathered on the unceded territory of the tsleil Squamish, and Kwikwitlam and Musqueam First Nations people. I'm Dr. Leslie Shannon, and this is the final season, season the final speaker. <laughs> December's coming. We're, 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 we're running out here. The final speaker in the President's Dream Colloquium. I'm the chair for this colloquium on women in technology, recruitment, retention, and promotion. I'm also the NSERC chair, which is the Natural Sciences and Engineering Research Council chair for women in science and engineering for the BC Yukon region. We run a program for women and diversity and inclusion called West Coast Women in Engineering, Science, and Technology that's based here at SFU. Our mission is to engage industry, the community, and students to increase the awareness and participation of women and other underrepresented groups in science, technology, engineering, and mathematics, or the STEM fields of study and careers. This program for us has been a real opportunity, so we thank everyone who's been coming out to really see all these talks. Tonight's speaker is Jo Miller. She's the CEO and founder of Be Leaderly. So she's a leading authority on women's leadership and a sought after dynamic and engaging speaker. I've seen her multiple times. Uh, if you tried to see her at Grace Hopper this year, at least half of the people were unlucky enough that they weren't able to because she was so popular. She had two 600 person rooms filled and still everybody who wanted to see her speak couldn't see her. So we're very lucky and very excited. She delivers more than 70 speaking presentations annually to audiences of up to 1,200 women. Her expertise lies in helping women lead, climb, and thrive in corporate cultures. And she delivers keynotes and workshops for women in leadership conferences, professional associations, and corporate women's initiatives for companies including Boeing, eBay, Expedia, NetApp, PayPal, Microsoft, and many more. So with that, and no further ado, I'd like to introduce Jo Miller. Thank you. a lovely introduction. All right, so um, I want to start with a fun factoid. Um, so researchers um, with Microsoft in Canada uh, a few years ago sought to understand um, the impact it's had on our human attention spans uh, now that we've surrounded ourselves with all of these digital devices, you know, the ones I mean that you have glued to your hand and in your back pocket all day, uh, because apparently back in the year 2000, our human attention span was all of 12 seconds. And I know that sounds kind of short, doesn't it? But that's the amount of time that we apparently, way back then, could focus on a certain thought or idea or concept before we distracted ourselves. Now, um, that number has moved downward um, thanks to uh, you know, the laptops, the tablets, the smartphones, all the devices that, that we surround ourselves with. Does anyone want to guess, and feel free to call out your number, what do you think that, that number is today? It's no longer 12 seconds. What do you think it is? Four, three, five. You're, you're pessimists, aren't you? <laughs> so the, uh, the number's actually seven seconds, which is kind of shocking, isn't it? Seven seconds before we distract ourselves. Now, as a point of comparison, uh, the attention span of a goldfish is eight seconds. So you all feel better about yourself. So with that, and I think it goes with or without saying, you, you probably now have an incentive to put all those devices away for, for the duration of our time together. Um, so that's the first thing I, I wanted to say to start. The second is, um, well, so right now I know most of you are incredibly focused and present and in the moment. You're completely engaged with me and what I'm saying. Uh, but the person sitting next to you might be having a goldfish moment. They might have just distracted themselves. Um, and right now they're thinking, wow, that lady has a really cool accent. <laughs> Don't lie. Some of you were thinking that, weren't you? So, so just a little piece about my background in addition to what Leslie said. I actually grew up in Australia and then moved to California, lived in the Silicon Valley region there for 10 years. And then recently with my husband's career, relocated to Cedar Rapids in Iowa. So Australia to California to Iowa has been my journey. So the accent you hear, it's Australifornia Iowan. <laughs> so listen up, you might not hear another one anytime soon, if ever, and if you do, I want to meet them. 
promise. <laughs> okay, so um, one more thing about me. As the only Australian women's leadership coach and speaker in the state of Iowa, I have some unique qualifications that I'm excited to share with you. And by the way, this is, this hands down is going to be the cutest slide in the whole deck. They all, I promise, they get much less cute from here. All right, so that's enough about me. Um, we're here to talk about women and leadership and, and innovation. And um, so I'm told that, that you like data. Do you like data? Want to start with some data? All right, so that there's also um, the data brings good news and bad news. So which, which do you want first? Bad news. All right, I'm glad you said that because that's what's on the slide. <laughs> so, uh, so, so, um, you know, when it comes to women and leadership and innovation, five, five uh, data points that I kind of cherry pick, but they're some of my favorite points when we turn to this topic of women in technology and leadership. Um, and, and, you know, the ability to produce and innovate and, and build and bring new things to market. Um, first thing I wanted to share, and this one comes from NC Wirt. Are you familiar with NC Wirt? National Center uh, for Women and Information Technology, but they do some terrific work and research. NC Wirt found um, in 2015 um, that women made up 25% of the computing workforce. So, you know, really not a lot, about, 20, about a quarter. Um, girls who code, uh, working with Accenture, um, actually project that that number is expected to move in the wrong direction, to fall to 22% um, by 2025. And then the Silicon Valley Bank, um, in their update this year on the state of play for startups, found that 70% of startups have no women on their boards um, and 54% um, don't even have any female executives. Um, and then back to NC Wit again, though, though this number is a little old. This is actually from back in 2008, but people keep quoting it. And um, to me, that says that no one's come along and measured it since, or maybe that it hasn't changed. I'm not, I'm not sure which. Um, but that 50, 56% of women um, that start their careers in technology actually leave their employers mid-career. Now, some of them are leaving technology altogether, um, and a very high number of them plan never to return. Some of them are leaving their employers uh, as well. Um, but in either case, it's, it's not a good number. And then um, recently, this year, the Kapoor Center for, uh, for Social Impact um, looked at people who leave uh, technology jobs um, and among the women, um, by far the number one reason for leaving was this uh, was unfair treatment and the unfair behavior that they encountered, which could encompass things like, um, you know, lack of uh, opportunities, promotion, stereotyping, harassment and bullying. Um, so when it comes to, again, women in, in leadership and innovation, there's good news and bad news. This is, this is the tough news. Um, on the next slide, guess what? There is some good news. And actually, there's six of those where there's only five of these, if that's of any consolation. So um, here comes some of the good news. Um, you know, as many of us are aware, because it's been very well publicized and studied in recent years, um, having more women in senior management improves um, performance, financial performance, profit, productivity across the board um, in, in a wide range of different industries and organizations, but especially um, when innovation is a key piece of their strategy. Um, and that comes from a 2008 study of 1,500 U.S. firms in, in the S&P. Um, and then uh, Cindy Padnos, who is a partner with venture capital uh, firm Illuminate Ventures, um, compiled a uh, hundred different studies based on um, uh, you know, gender and technology. And one of the things that she recognized was that venture-backed tech companies that are led by women are far more efficient in their use of capital. Um, and you know, part of that reason might be they have a harder time attracting that capital and use it better when they do. But they generate 12% more revenue from one third less capital. So far more efficient. Um, uh, Anita Woolley and Thomas Malone um, studied uh, the impact of women in teams and found that teams con containing more women demonstrated greater collective intelligence compared to those with fewer women. Um, and part of where that came from was when you add um, one or more women to a team that had been completely um, uh, filled with, with men, 
um, it increases the social, social sensitivity and things like um, turn taking. So everyone you know, gets a voice and gets a turn in speaking up and creates this sense of psychological safety, which ultimately led to um, greater collective intelligence. And so one of the fascinating things is if you have an all-male team, um, you can do two things. You could add a woman to the team or you could add another male of higher intelligence and yet it's adding the woman that raises the collective intelligence in the team, which is kind of cool when you think about it. Um, next up from London Business School, um, they uh, found that teams with an even mix of men and women produce more innovative ideas and they found that 50-50 gender balance in teams um, was actually the, uh, you know, the most productive in terms of producing innovation. Um, and then uh, back to NC Wit again, they found that IT patents produced by mixed gender teams were cited 30 to 40 percent uh, more frequently. Um, they studied it uh, firstly a few years ago, 2008 or 2009, and then looked at it again in 2012, and the number had stayed fairly stable. Um, and then finally, Sil Sylvia Ann Hewlett, Center for Talent Innovation. Um, and this, this one's great. This is kind of the glue that brings it all together for me. They found that leaders who ensure that women's voices are heard are 89% more likely to elicit um, innovative contributions from those women. Um, so, of course, having women in those groups and in those teams matters, but even more so um, that they're able to have a voice and speak up and be influencers and have a seat at the table can really um, make a difference. Um, so, of course, you know, with women in leadership and innovation, there's good news and there's bad news. There aren't nearly enough women in these roles, but um, when they do enter into those teams or participate in them can make a real difference in the profitability and productivity and the innovation. So my work over the past 15 years has been about going into primarily companies, large corporations that want to advance more women into management uh, positions, um, but also into technical leadership roles. And because I'm uh, most commonly brought in by the Corporate Women's Network or a grassroots women's leadership initiative, um, I'm often working with early career and mid-level women. So not so much the senior execs or senior leadership teams, but women that are um, you know, in the first half of their career but aspire to climb to that next level, be it into a management role or technical leadership, or sometimes just stay in the role that they're in and make a greater impact, so lead or influence or, or make a bigger, bigger difference um, and you know, be world class in what they do. I would say that having lived in the Silicon Valley region for a decade, um, probably 60 to 70 percent of the companies that I work with are tech companies. Um, so as Leslie mentioned, it's you know, eBay, PayPal, Microsoft. Um, you know, I've done work with Google and Expedia and Amazon. Um, and those other companies that aren't, you know, possibly what we think of as tech um, are often in industries that have been more traditionally considered to be a man's world, like, um, you know, energy and finance and heavy industry and manufacturing. So it just gives you a sense of who, who I'm working with. And so um, a lot of what I talk about is how to lead from where you are but also raise your hand to advance yourself to your next level in your career because I'm primarily working with those women. So um, a few years ago, I was speaking with a woman, a software engineer with a, with a big global software firm, and she said, I feel like I'm the best kept secret in this organization. And you know, maybe some of you can relate, maybe you felt like that too. But what she meant was she felt like she had a level of qualifications and skills and background and track record and potential that were up at a fairly high sophisticated level. And yet for some reason she couldn't seem to figure out, everyone else perceived her as somewhat less. And so there was a gap between what she brought to the table and was capable of and how everyone else saw her. And unfortunately, until she found ways to close that perception gap, she wasn't going to be invited into whatever was next for her, be it to lead a, a bigger project or, you know, step up to lead a team, to break into management for the first time or, um, you know, that broader, more responsible role. But close the gap, she did ultimately using 
big surprise, uh, some of the concepts that I'll share with you tonight. And, and when she closed that gap in perception, she started to attract those opportunities um, that she felt had been escaping her earlier. Um, and, and so this is a fairly common thing. I find that um, a lot of women, especially early on or mid-level in their career, feel like they're that invisible employee, that best kept secret. So because I'm always just curious to know, um, could we see by a show of hands here who, and don't be shy, just raise your hand if you've ever felt like that best kept secret in the organization, whether it be uh, your career or you know your student career, um, just go ahead and raise that hand up high. Thank you, thanks. Um, and so if you are sitting next to your peers or your colleagues or your professor or even your boss, um, just go ahead and blink your eyes twice if you didn't raise your hand. <laughs> I think we can all relate, right? We've all felt like the best kept secret. So, um, you know, there are so many different interventions and solutions. Um, you've heard some great ones during the, the series um, of this colloquium to, you know, advance um, and, and attract um, and retain women. I'm going to drill down on a fairly narrow slice, um, a topic that I'm really passionate about, um, that is one that is a, definitely a piece of that puzzle, but one we don't hear spoken about nearly enough, and that's, that's sponsorship. Um, so sponsorship first came to my attention a few years ago when I was reading Harvard Business Review, and this article caught my eye, and, and the first reason that it caught my attention was the title. Now, the title is Why Men Still Get More Promotions Than Women. And um, maybe you agree, that's got to that's grab your attention. And so the authors of a study were talking about, um, were reporting on, on uh, what they discovered through their study. Um, so they said that there's a special kind of relationship called sponsorship in which a mentor goes beyond giving feedback and advice and uses his or her influence with senior executives to advocate for the mentee. Our interviews and surveys alike suggest that high potential women are over-mentored but under-sponsored relative to male peers and that that's one of the reasons that they're not advancing uh, uh, as rapidly within their organizations. Um, so again, this really caught my attention and started me along this journey of, uh, of learning more about sponsorship and its role in, in women advancing their careers. Um, and so I just encourage you to think about whether you might be one of those high potential women or men who's uh, feeling a little over mentored and under sponsored. And if so, um, hopefully in our time together, you'll, you know, you'll, you'll have some ideas some tips and tricks to walk away with. Um, by the way, if you haven't figured it out already, I'm not an academic. I, I'm much more about like what's a practical, you know, one or two tips or tricks you can walk away with to put into practice immediately. So, you know, keep that in mind if there's one or two things that you can walk away with to, um, to take action on. All right. So um, I, you, I, what I want to talk about is how to attract the advocacy of those influential sponsors that can make a real difference to your career trajectory. Um, so how I'll carve out that time is, um, you know, one of the, the, the first questions I generally hear is, well, what's the difference between a mentor and a sponsor? So I'll certainly address that, um, as well as because mentors are really valuable people, we don't want to overlook them. Um, I have a favorite tool for making the most of every conversation you have with a mentor or if you're mentoring others with a mentee. So I'll share that quick model with you so you've got a tool to walk away with to make the most of those relationships. But then talk about um, some steps to take to attract um, that attention and advocacy of uh, perhaps your next great sponsor. Um, and then just a little about sponsoring others just to kind of close the, close the loop, close the circle there. Um, so, you know, just, just think ahead about whether there's anything that you'd most like to, to get from our time together. Um, but firstly, what is a sponsor? Well, a few years ago in a women's leadership webinar, I got the chance to interview Cindy Kent, who I think has about the coolest job title there is. 
She's a GM with 3M. You like that? A GM with 3M. How cool is that? Um, so, and, and so when I asked Sydney, what is a sponsor? She said, it's someone who will use their internal political and social capital to move your career forward within an organization. And behind closed doors, they will argue your case. Um, she actually went on to say it's someone who will pound their fist on the table on your behalf when you're not in the room. So clearly someone with influence who in those, you know, those talent development discussions where you're not able to be in the room, they're there representing you and putting your name forward. Um, so that's a great description of what a sponsor is and does. Uh, just a few weeks ago, I spoke with Julie Mullineff, who is an executive vice president with uh, a, a, an industry association for the construction industry. And I include this because it's just such a great and, a, and slightly expanded view of what a sponsor does. Um, she said it's someone who believes in you and pushes you to reach your potential. They instill confidence in you and encourage you to acknowledge and embrace that potential. So part of sponsorship, of course, is giving you that push to throw your hat in the ring, to you know, put your name out there for something that you might not feel entirely ready for, but they have this bigger vision of you and what, the, what you're capable of and, and really give you a push to achieve that, that vision, that potential. Um, so um, Sylvia Ann Hewlett is someone who has quite literally written the book on sponsorship. Um, she's done a lot of research into this and speaking with Jenna Goudreau in Business Insider uh, a few years ago um, in that article they acknowledged that there are four US based and global studies that clearly show that it's sponsorship and not so much mentorship which is how power gets transferred in uh, our workplaces especially those corporate workplaces so if you think about you know how does power kind of cascade down or how do people grow in their credibility and authority and influence um, well, they've found that it's um, more so sponsorship than mentorship. So, of course, I know some of you are like on the edge of your seat waiting to find out what's the difference between uh, a mentor and a sponsor. Um, I have three, three kind of neat ways of articulating it. Hopefully they're memorable. Um, my good friend, Kate Houston, who is a, a woman in tech, she uh, leads mobile development teams, uh, once said to me, well, mentors give you perspective whereas sponsors give you opportunities. You like that? So perspective versus opportunities. Um, I'm sure a, a number of you have heard of the Catalyst organization that does research into women in leadership. Um, Heather Faust Cummings with Catalyst said, mentors talk with you while sponsors talk about you. And then actually a, a great woman once said, no, just kidding, it was me, um, said, mentors help you skill up while sponsors help you move up. So perspective versus opportunities talks with you uh, versus talks about you helps you skill up versus move up. Is that fairly clear? Mentors versus sponsors? Okay, so we'll come back around to sponsors in, in a few minutes, but I did want to just talk about the, the different phases of your career, of a person's career, and how you might utilize these a little differently. Um, so earlier chatting with Leslie and, and her group of students, um, I said that, you know, even though we're talking about sponsorship in, in this session, as you just kind of graduate into the workforce for those first few years early on in your career, you probably want to focus on enlisting mentors, people who help you round out your skills, understand strengths and, and you know, overcome or compensate for weaknesses, someone who you can go to for you know, feedback and advice and perspectives. So early on, you can really benefit from having a, you know, a few great mentors. But as you sort of get you know, beyond four or five years into, into the swing of your career, as you get toward mid-level, now you want to diversify uh, mentors um, and, and have maybe different, different mentors for different reasons and different seasons. Um, some people internal to your organization who can help you learn the ropes, but maybe some outsiders to, to give you a very different perspective. Uh, you might want formal and informal mentoring relationships. So diversify your mentors. 
um, attract and enlist sponsors who help you, you know, move to that next level in your career, but also uh, good to cultivate peer advocates, people that are at a similar phase and level as you, um, but you can certainly, you know, back each other up when you're, um, you know, raising a, kind of a risky idea or speaking up or someone who could put your name forward, though they might not have the influence to make it happen. Um, so people who you support who also support you. So diversify mentors, um, enlist sponsors, but also cultivate those peer advocates. Um, and as you get toward that later phase in your career, either senior level or what I call the legacy phase, where you start to kind of turn around and look to pay it forward and, and bring others up, um, of course, be a mentor and a sponsor. Um, you know, be that talent scout, be cultivating others. But if you want to take it one step further, don't just be a mentor and a sponsor, but try to foster a culture of mentorship and sponsorship in your organization. Um, so that your, your actions can have a ripple effect beyond just, just yourself. Um, and, you know, as we talk about the importance of diversity and inclusion, um, you know, may, maybe take steps to make sure that sponsorship is taking in place in ways that are transparent and open um, and fair and equitable. Um, and so you can use your influence with other leaders at your level to really make an impact on the culture around sponsorship. So just think about where you're currently at, what phase fits best for you, and what might be your, you know, your next step to, to take. So um, with that in mind, I, and as I get deeper into the, the deck of slides, some of them have a lot of text on them. Um, and so uh, it's actually not uploaded yet, but tomorrow um, I'll have these available for you at beleaderly.com, which is my blog site. Um, so beleaderly.com slash SFU where you can grab a copy of the slides and, um, you know, keep a copy for yourself, reflect back on them, or even uh, I'll encourage you to share those with others who might benefit as well. Um, so uh, quick question, um, by a show of hands, who has had a mentor? Just go ahead and raise your hand and just look around and note that it's, it's the majority of people. In fact, it might be better to ask who hasn't had a mentor. Just go ahead and raise your hand. All right, like one or two people. Um, that's quite remarkable. Um, and, and you'll notice that the, that, that the number will probably be different when we get to sponsorship. But go ahead and raise your hand again if you've ever mentored someone else, which again is really wonderful. And if you've not already mentored someone else, I really encourage you to do so. It's a great way to figure out what you already know, um, but it's good karma as well. Um, I was watching a, a panel of senior women leaders speak recently and someone asked, how would you thank a mentor? And all four of the panelists agreed, you thank a mentor by turning around and paying it forward by mentoring others. So thank your mentor and mentor someone else if you haven't already done that. Um, so this next quick tool I'll share is a way to make the most of those mentoring conversations, whether you are the one being mentored or, um, you know, this is also a tool that you can share with any of your, um, the, the people that you mentor so that they can come fully prepared to every conversation as well. But it's a way of um, being fully prepared before a conversation with a mentor to make sure that the conversation is robust and valuable for, for both parties. Um, and in fact, I'll often hear people saying that they've been, you know, talking to their mentor maybe for a year or more, and they'll see that upcoming um, mentoring conversation on their calendar, and they'll start to scratch their head and, and, and say, well, is there anything left to talk about? And wonder whether the, the mentorship relationship may have run its course. So with this tool, you need never feel that way. Um, because you'll always have something to bring to the table, some questions to ask a mentor. In fact, I'll, I'll say this, this tool can be so valuable um, that you can stay with your mentor for years to come, so much so that this mentor and mentee, uh, they've been mentoring for so long that even the younger one has wrinkles. That's how good this tool is. <laughs> All right, so it's called the four S's of mentoring successes, four questions to prepare ahead of every conversation with a mentor. 
um, to have it be a really robust and valuable conversation um, and have both of you leave feeling like uh, it, w it was really time well spent. Um, they all start with a certain letter of the alphabet. Can anyone guess what it is? With a letter S. Yeah, so much like Sesame Street brought to you by the letter S, we have the four S's of mentoring successes. So the first question to prepare ahead of any conversation with a mentor is one that asks them to tell one of their stories, right? Because everyone loves talking about themselves. It's a great way to break the ice and begin a conversation. So um, ahead of every conversation with a mentor, think of one question that asks them to tell one of their career stories. For example, you could ask, how did you get to where you are today? That's kind of an obvious one. Or you might ask something like, was there a time when you felt like you derailed or messed up or failed? Um, and what happened and how did you bounce back? So I bring a question that asks them to tell one of their stories. Next up, situations. Think of a situation that you're currently dealing with, um, one that you know you, it might be valuable to get your mentor's input. Uh, for example, perhaps you have two very different pathways you could take from, you know, from this point forward. Maybe, uh, you know, two different professional pathways or even roles. Um, and you could bring those to your mentor and ask, you know, which one do you think is the better fit for me? Or maybe, um, you know, you tried a new skill like delegation and it didn't go well. And you can bring that to your mentor and ask for their input. So bring a situation that you're dealing with and ask for you know, their perspective. Next up, self-awareness. And again, one of the things we spoke about earlier today with the student group was the value of uh, being able to understand how others perceive you. Um, and so that's something that your mentor can help with. They can kind of hold up the mirror and help you understand how you're perceived by others. So questions you could ask would be things like, um, you know, how are my verbal and written communication skills? Or uh, perhaps you gave a presentation recently and you'd love your, your mentor's feedback on, on how you came across. Or another one, um, you know, for those of you, in, in, those of you in the workforce, you could say, you know, what do you think my personal brand is within this group? What am I known for? What am I known for doing well and, you know, not well? So allow your mentor to contribute to your building of, of self-awareness. And then finally, skill building. Think of a, a particular skill you're working on. Um, it could be one that your mentor can maybe give you some tips and advice or share some tools or resources. Um, at a workshop recently, um, one woman shared that her question would be, uh, she would say to her mentor, um, you, you are a very confident and, um, and seasoned um, public speaker. How did you build those skills? Um, or perhaps, you know, you'd like some pointers on how to better negotiate, um, for example. So think of a question that allows your mentor to contribute to your building of skills. So as you can see, if you just take a few minutes ahead of every conversation with a mentor to prepare one question from each quadrant, it's probably going to be a good and valuable discussion for both of you um, and also might, you know, might be likely to, um, to you know, run out of time. In, you know, if you've got an hour or so allotted or 30 minutes, you're probably going to run out of um, those questions by the end. So or time for those questions. So um, what I want you to do is think about um, uh, a question that you could customize from this model that would be valuable for you to ask a mentor. So pick a quadrant, one that's especially meaningful for you. Um, so pick one of the quadrants and then go ahead and um, either think of a question or even if you're taking notes, go ahead and write one down, write down a specific question you could ask of a mentor that would be of value to you related to that quadrant. I'll just give you about 30 seconds now to figure out or think through or write down what that would be. So what's a quadrant that would be useful to you once you know that? Come up with a specific question that you could ask a mentor that would be of value to you right now.
when you know what that is, I really encourage you to turn to someone sitting near you. So one or two people. So just arrange yourself in quick groups of two or three. You might have to look up or down a row if there's no one sitting right next to you. Um, but arrange yourself into groups of two or three. Um, and just do a quick, quick go round and share uh, what your question is that you would ask of a mentor. And I'll give you about two minutes. Go. All right, everyone, I'm going to invite you now to wrap up on your conversation, if you would. Go ahead and bring that to a close and just bring your attention back here. And I wondered if we could just maybe hear from one or two of you with your questions. So, um, and, and, oh, Danielle's got the microphone, so we'll bring the mic out to you. Um, but we're looking for a volunteer. So raise your hand if you'd like to volunteer the person sitting next to you. No, just kidding. So <laughs> no, you can volunteer yourself. So what was yours? Talk about what Jay said. I oh, you did. You were volunteers. This idea. Um, so his thought was on stories, and he would ask the person about um, finding um, some ideas about finding a partner, like in your personal life, um, because sometimes that would impact your professional career if you had a good or bad partner. So along those lines. Right. So right, like kind of finding the right supportive partner yeah. um, as a support for your professional life as well. Thank you. Very interesting. Yes. 
Um, maybe one more person, another volunteer, or like point to someone sitting next to you if they had an especially good question to you. Oh, look at that. You were volatile. Did you see that happen? <laughs> you had your head down, but she, she, the person sitting next to you pointed to you. <laughs> so I had a mentor that was kind of like jack of all trades. So my question will be like, any tips on how to like balance life and school and like work and basically like they seem like they had it all so it's just like how how to balance that all yeah that's great like no really how do you how do you do it all how do you make it all work and thank you Right. So, um, again, use this to prepare for any conversation with a mentor. But those of you who mentor others, um, feel free to give this model to them and say, hey, go, you know, push it off onto your, your mentee to bring themselves to those conversations fully prepared. All right. So, uh, let's get back to sponsorship, though. Uh, so, another of the leaders that I interviewed is Amanda Martinez of Albertsons, where she's a, um, a group vice president of procurement. And she said, um, what is a sponsor? Well, it's a person with a seat at the decision-making table who will throw your name out for those coveted assignments or promotion opportunities. So what I'm curious to know now by a show of hands is, have you had a sponsor? Now, before you raise your hand, what I often find is that people aren't entirely sure. Sometimes you have a sponsor and, and, and things are moving for you. Um, opportunities are coming your way or you know your career is moving with momentum, um, but you didn't know that there was a sponsor. But oftentimes if things are happening for you, there may be a sponsor behind the scenes pulling strings. So raise your hand if you're fairly certain you may have had a sponsor, like 75% or more certain. All right, good, good. Yeah, like this you like this but, but that's okay that's normal and did you look around and notice that it was a lesser number so it's usually around about 50% to two-thirds of the number that raised their hand for having a mentor now um, for those of you who raised your hand could we hear from someone um, and specifically what I'd love to hear from you is how did it begin so what initiated the sponsorship how did it start and then what did the sponsor do um, that helped you. So what did they do that was a benefit to you? And just raise your hand if you've got a story that you're willing to share. Awesome. Yeah, over here. Get the mic over to you. Thank you. Uh, it was a person in my department when I first started working in a university, and she was the only other person in my department who knew math and understood math. So we just clicked. And then she was also higher up. She was assistant director at the time. And so she started feeding me some of the data work that she was doing and then fed me a class that I could teach and then started very slowly for the first, like, two years. And then as she got closer to retirement, like, about three years out, she started just feeding me a lot more projects to take on and to do. So that way when she retired, I moved up in the organization. So it was definitely a long term. It was about 12 years that I had her. And she just kept getting me promotions and raises and new responsibilities. Yeah. Which is amazing. That's a great. It is amazing, isn't it? Hold on to the mic for a moment. So what do you think she saw in you that had her um, start to send opportunities your way? Um, I mean, first off, again, just we were the only two in the department who understood data and could read a graph and could talk. A lot of people who can read a graph and do math can't talk about it. So she started being able to have someone else who could do her work. And she could send me to other departments to talk about it and promote the department, which was great. So it gave her less to do. Plus, we just got along. We had a lot of just different stuff in common. And I went over to the house for dinner often. She was great. That's great. Great example. Great example. Um, you know, she spotted some talent, some like a, like a unique skill set that really stood out. Um, and I get the part of it was like, oh, I can put some of my work off my plate to this person who's really confident and, and will do it well and will make me look good as well. Um, so thanks for sharing that. That was a great example. 
Um, so as I shared earlier, there is a sponsorship gap between men and women. Um, if we're talking about the corporate workforce here, um, let's play guess the numbers. So firstly, what percentage of women uh, inside large companies do you think have a sponsor? And feel free to call out your number. 10, 20, 12, okay, any others? Seven? Hey, kind of like, yeah, we're, we're good, but between 7 and, and 20, which isn't bad, but the actual number is 13. Is anyone surprised? All right, so what do you think the number is for men? What percentage of men in large companies have had a sponsor? 80, 70, 60, 30? So we're sort of going between 30 and 80 is, is about the range. All right, so the number might surprise you. It's 19. Anyone surprised? So there is a sponsorship gap, but but maybe it, it's you know from both extremes it's it's coming a little closer in than you might have guessed. Um, some more data, and, and by the way, this comes from um, work done by Sylvia and Hewlett and her organization um, in a study called the Sponsor Effect. Um, women who have sponsors are at least 22% more likely to ask for things like stretch assignments and raises. And, um, you know, the way I understand it is if you have an influential sponsor who's kind of looking out for you, it's a bit like a safety net that allows you to take a few risks. So you're a bit more likely to raise your hand for these things. And by the way, other studies have shown that people who ask for things like raises and promotions and stretch assignments are, um, I know this is shocking, are far more likely to get them. Like not everyone asks for these things, but those that ask are more likely to get. So a sponsor can really make a difference for you taking some risks and self-advocating. Men and women both feel more satisfied with their career advancement when they have sponsors, and ambitious women underestimate the difference that sponsorship can make. So do we have any ambitious women here? I'm sure we do. <laughs> I met some a little earlier, handsome men. Um, so you're probably underestimating the difference that a sponsor, you know, could make for you in, in your career. Um, as Kerry Porano from American Express says, having an active advocate completely changes your career. And I think she means for the better, right? Do we, think, do we agree she means for the better? Um, so what then do you think are the qualities that would make someone a good sponsor? And here... I might just have you call out your responses and I'll, I'll repeat them back. But you know, what do you think are some of the qualities that would make someone a good and effective sponsor? They're respected, yes. Yeah, they must have the respect of others um, or else they're putting your name forward. Their advocacy wouldn't, wouldn't lead anywhere, would it? It wouldn't <laughs> It'd do the opposite. What else? Well respected? Good network, yes, yeah, because um, how are they going to know where the opportunities lie if they're not getting out and meeting with and talking to and, you know, un understanding what's going on? What else? Dig a little deeper. Well-respected network. Sorry, what? Yes, they have decision-making power. Yep, good one. Any others? Right, right. Like your example earlier, they need to get to know you um, or else how are they going to know your strengths and, and where your talents might be a, a, a good match. Um, so good. So think about who the, the good sponsors are uh, around you. Um, you know, if you're in the workforce currently, think about, you know, who are the leaders that might have those qualities. Um, you know, if you're currently um, in, you know, if you're currently a student, um, you might have to think a, a, a little more laterally about what a sponsor is, but it might be, um, you know, that professor who can write you a recommendation or who has great connections in industry and might be able to put your name out there for an internship or a role um, or, you know, that very well-networked peer who, who could do the same, who has some influence as well. Um, you know, so think about who you know who could be 
um, a good sponsor. Um, Millette Granville at Del Hayes makes a really important point that a, a sponsor doesn't have to be an executive or even a, a senior leader, but they do need to have influence, right? So they need to be able to influence, um, you know, those opportunities, those the, the course of your career, those outcomes. So they don't necessarily need to be in a high-level leadership role, but they need to be an influencer. Um, and uh, one more point here, Michelle Johnston Holthouse of Intel asks a great question. She asked, are all your advocates in the management chain directly above you? I recommend that everyone have three to four advocates outside their direct management chain. And if you are you know, going to be graduating into a career where there's um, you know, some churn or some change, uh, turbulent times going on, or if you're in an organization that's faced that too, um, you probably don't need me to tell you why diversifying your sponsors could be a very good idea. So, of course, the question at this point is always, how do I get a sponsor? And when I was speaking with my interview with Cindy Kent and Amanda Martinez, I asked that question like, okay, how do we get a sponsor? And they both talked over the top of each other in unison to say, wait, no, that's not how it works, and went on to describe how you don't choose the sponsor. Can anyone guess why? Well, you don't choose the sponsor. The sponsor chooses you, right? So um, the Catalyst organization has said that there's no silver bullet for attracting the attention of a high-level influential sponsor. But at the same time, through my conversations with leaders like the ones that I've just named and mentioned, um, and with you know audiences, groups of women who've been sponsored, I've come to understand that although we don't choose our sponsors, there's certainly some behaviors we can exhibit more of in order to make it all the more likely that a sponsor will choose to advocate for you. Um, so I'm going to share eight steps that you can take to make it all the more likely that you will attract that advocacy of an influential sponsor. As I go through the list of eight, I want you to listen for, you know, which ones of these might be and maybe just aim to, to pick one or two that you might need to work on or do more of in order to make it all the more likely that you'll attract sponsorship. So um, first one, of course, is uh, that you need to build a baseline of outstanding performance. And, and think about that. If you're not going above and beyond to truly perform and, um, and knock it out of the park in terms of your performance, well, uh, could you really expect to have a sponsor lay their reputation on the line to advocate for you? Possibly not. So build a foundation of great performance first. You've got to, you've got to be a star. But then find out who the good sponsors are. And we just had a conversation about some of those qualities. Well-respected, uh, you know, well-networked, etc. cetera. Um, so just start to pay attention and notice who are those uh, leaders or those professors, for example, that are great talent developers and talent scouts and seem to be making those connections and, and, um, and you know, pushing people towards opportunities. And if there are good sponsors around you, you really owe it to yourself to figure out who those people are. Um, but also observe the protocols because every different organizational group has its own rules of the game. Um, and so it might be valuable to observe who gets sponsored and how it works. And if you're not sure, look for who seems to be getting opportunities. Because as I said earlier, chances are there's a sponsor behind the scenes pulling strings, making stuff happen. And if you know that individual well, you might go and ask them, look, hey, you seem to be getting opportunities. Do you have a sponsor? Um, how are you connecting with those opportunities? And if, you know, how does it work? So just pay attention to the protocols and, and how it works so you don't make any missteps. Um, but, you know, networking is really key. Now, if you're in the workforce, it's about networking above and beyond your immediate workplace and your management chain. If you're currently a student, 
It might mean, you know, just paying attention to what's going on in that professional industry that you would like to ultimately graduate into and start to build a network um, of, you know, influencers and leaders or, um, you know, just high performing uh, people who will be your peers as well. So it's about networking, networking, networking um, above and beyond your immediate sphere. Um, but then when you spot a, a good sponsor um, and you start to build, you know, rapport or build a relationship and include them in your network, um, it's, it's a really good idea to look for opportunities for them to get a direct experience of you and your work. And your example earlier was great. You know, your sponsor saw that you were great with data, but you could also talk about it in a compelling and articulate way. So you want to allow these potential sponsors to get a direct experience of the value of um, the work that you can deliver. Because I find, you know, probably eight times out of 10, that's where a sponsorship begins. They see you in action and they go, aha, here's someone um, who has great strengths and I can start to see a bigger vision for that person and where they fit. So raise your hand for those opportunities. Um, so next up, make your value visible. Don't be the best kept secret. Um, so what does this look like? Well, it means, you know, if you achieve something noteworthy, um, don't, keep it a, don't keep it a secret. Um, in my conversation with Danielle earlier today, we talked about how work doesn't speak for itself. You need to speak up and, and advocate for yourself and your accomplishments. Um, so it means taking a seat at the table and speaking up and having a voice, whether it be in your workplace or in your classes, you know, be that person who speaks up and asks a great question that shows what you know or contributes an idea. Um, so look for ways to make your value visible that feel appropriate to you, you know, kind of a good fit for your personal brand, but also seem to be rewarded and recognized within um, the, the culture around you. So if you're not sure how to do this, pay attention to who gets recognized and what were the steps they took. So what were they doing to promote the value of their strengths and, and their accomplishments? All right, so make your value visible. Don't be the best kept secret. Um, all right, I lied to you earlier. Um, the koala was maybe not the cutest slide rocket dog is. <laughs> this is, this is uh, painted by a friend of mine, Sheridan Martin. So I, I call this one rocket dog. Um, and rocket dog is here to say, have clear goals. So whatever your goals are for the next phase in your education or in your career as a leader, it pays to have clarity about those um, because, you know, is a sponsor really going to know where to connect you if you're not clear what you want for yourself? So have clarity. I have a, a quick story to share. It comes from the corporate world, but it's one of my favorites uh, about a woman who I spoke with a few years ago who had taken a big step down in her career to move to a company which was one that she really wanted to spend the rest of her working life with. Um, but in taking a step down, it didn't take more than about nine months before she was kind of feeling bored. Um, but that next opportunity to step back up into that prior level role wasn't, wasn't forthcoming. And I remember asking her, well, you know, is, is your leadership, are they clear that that's your goal? And she couldn't honestly say that they were. So I said, all right, here's your homework. In the next two weeks, have five conversations with leaders. Now, pick a moment where it's appropriate. Um, but find a way of throwing your goal into those conversations. And, you know, she felt a little tentative. So we practiced and role played that she would say, I believe I've mastered my current role. And what I'd like to do next is and name that next role. So she wasn't saying, I'm done or I'm bored or conveying a sense of entitlement, just putting it out there that you know, I feel like I've mastered this role and here's what I'd like to do next. Well, we ended our conversation and a little while later, uh, one of her leaders stopped by just to check in on something that, that she was working on. And they had that conversation. And just as he turned to go, she said, wait, there's one more thing. And, and she felt, you know, her throat get tight and her heart beat in her chest and not in her stomach. But she managed to say, I believe I've mastered my role. And 
here is what I'm interested in doing next. So she got the words out and he turned to go like it hadn't really sunk in. That 15 minutes later he was back and he said, you know, I think I might have just the opportunity for you. Now, I want to be clear. It doesn't usually happen that quickly, especially not in academia, <laughs> to be very clear. But you can see the principle, right? If you want to attract the advocacy of those influential sponsors, have clear goals and share those goals with people who are empowered to make that connection because um, by and large, uh, those leaders in your life and in your career, they're often tasked with making very quick decisions on who to throw into a special assignment or uh, you know who to who to trust with a a, a really high profile opportunity or they might need to staff up a team or an organization or a role um, very quickly at, at short notice but if you've taken time to educate and maybe re-educate them about what your strengths are and what you want you may just help them make that match and make their life a whole lot easier so to attract that sponsorship, be clear about your goals, but share those goals with people who might be empowered to connect you. So here's the list again, and I want you to think about um, if there's anything here for you to do more of or do differently. Is it to, uh, you know, up, raise the bar in your performance or to figure out who the good sponsors are um, or what the protocols, the rules of the game are? or to network more widely with potential sponsors um, or raise your hand for those exposure opportunities where they might get to see the value of, of what you have to offer. Um, might it be making your value visible, you know, don't be shy about promoting your achievements and your strengths or have clarity on your goals or share those goals more widely with potential sponsors. So just think about whether there's one or two things here for you to do more of or do differently or just you know, bookmark for when you when you graduate into the workforce to you know to pay attention to to make sure you're attracting those sponsors. So just make sure you've got at least one thing to work on now or in future to attract that advocacy of an influential sponsor or two. So with that, just one final quick conversation. Wanted to just by a show of hands to see who here has sponsored others. Have you been a sponsor to others now that you know? what sponsorship is about. Um, and so this is really awesome. Of course, how do you thank a sponsor? Will you pay it forward by sponsoring others? So if you've not already sponsored others, um, I want you to know that it doesn't have to mean giving someone a promotion in their next role or finding them their next job. Um, there's something I call micro sponsorship, which might be as simple as, you know, when someone speaks up with a great idea, amplify their voice or uh, remind others around them of that person's strengths or advocate for them in a role even though you might not be the one to, to, to give it to them. Um, but, uh, you know, really do what you can to sponsor others in big and in small ways because that's probably the best and the fastest way to understand how sponsorship really works, right? By sponsoring others, you'll understand how you can be more attractive to a sponsor as well. Um, let me just hear from one person real quick who raised your hand. Uh, why did you choose to sponsor that person and how did you help them? anyone willing to share with us? Someone who raised your hand. Anyone willing to share? How did you sponsor someone? Thanks, Leslie. So um, as a faculty member, I obviously have a lot of students that I teach and graduate, and I've had the opportunity when I teach people to recognize good fits with potential companies. And I actually have made it a real target for my graduate students to identify companies that are good fits for them and so by the time they are graduating they already have a job and I've identified a good place for them to go but even still undergrads there's a few undergrads I've pulled out and said you know what this company is where you should go do a co-op that I will get you a reference you will get in just go that's awesome thank you a great reminder that you know you can be sponsored while you're in in, in, in your program um, you just reminded me to my brother-in-law who's probably 20 or 25 years into his career at this point every job he he's ever gotten has come from one of his professors from when he was in college 
That's incredible. The, yeah, so sponsorship can start, <laughs> it can start now. Um, so and, and feel free to call out um, your answers. What do you think it takes to be a good sponsor to others? What does it take to be a good sponsor? Things you need to be mindful of your, as you're sponsoring others to be, to do it well. Yeah, get to know their strengths for sure. What else? Right, know their strengths, but then see where they fit. What's that niche and direct them towards that. Anything else? Listen to them. Yeah, listen to what they want, um, what they're working on. Uh, see if you can connect the dots between the, you know, their what they're saying and their bigger vision, perhaps. Listen beyond the words. Anything else? Pushing them to stretch. Absolutely. Uh, I'll add, too, to bring it back around to our diversity conversation. You know, so often we think that sponsorship is about favoritism. Um, I wouldn't call that sponsorship other than bad sponsorship. So it might mean, you know, just challenging yourself to be diverse and fair and equitable in who you sponsor and even really open and transparent. Be clear with people what would it take for you to sponsor them and then let them meet that bar for performance as well as encouraging others around you to do the same, be fair, equitable, open and transparent so that you're starting to build that, that culture of really healthy sponsorship um, where sponsorship is open to all. So with that, uh, we've talked about women and leadership and innovation, some uh, Bad news and some good news, some facts, some figures. Uh, the difference between mentors and sponsors. Um, how to make the most of mentoring with the four S's of mentoring successes, that quick tool. And eight steps for attracting uh, the attention and advocacy of influential sponsors. And then just a little encouragement, I guess, to go out and sponsor others. Um, to learn how sponsorship works, but just also it's good karma. It's the right thing to do, of course. Um, so that's a here's where I'm meant to be. All right, so um, here are some recommended um, articles and resources. Um, the Anita Borg Institute did a, a wonderful paper uh, called Innovation by Design, the Case for Investing in Women. Um, and some of those facts, the data that I presented on women and innovation came from there, but it's a really wonderful summary. Charles Duhigg um, is an author with the New York Times who wrote a terrific article on what Google learned from its quest to build the perfect team. And if you want to understand more about the concept of psychological safety and building teams where everyone feels uh, able to speak up and innovate and contribute, that's a great article. Um, of course, why men still get more promotions than women uh, from Harvard Business Review is a good one. And then um, on that, uh, that website link that I'll, sh that I'll have ready for you tomorrow, um, I have a summary of articles called Why You Need a Sponsor, Not a Mentor. Um, it has, uh, you know, some of the benefits of sponsorship, but also a link to a lot of other articles that I recommend. Um, so here's where you'll find that. I'll have this ready for you tomorrow, beneaderly.com slash SFU, uh, with a link to the PowerPoint slides and a lot of those recommended reading and resources. So finally, I want to finish up with a favorite quote here from Millette Granville, who says, sponsorship can come to you in different ways. You never know who's watching. So be sponsor ready at all times, right? No pressure. Be sponsor ready at all times, including now. <laughs> so with that, um, I'm certainly willing to, you know, stay around. I think we have snacks and celebration uh, for the final session in the colloquium. But, um, you know, I'm certainly happy to answer any of the, of, of the questions that you have for me or just hear your thoughts and feedback. But was there anyone that had a, uh, a question now for me or for the group as a whole? Thank you. Yes. Sure. Yeah, I'll, I'll do my best. Yes. Uh, I believe I've mastered my current role, and what I'd like to do next is, and name the thing. So I believe I've mastered my role, and what I'd like to do next is, right. 
Did that? That was like half a question. Could we maybe have one more quick one? <laughs> Anyone else? Any more questions? Hopefully this will be brief, but um, as somebody who is more entrepreneurship driven, somebody who wants to have her own company in the future and is working towards that, how can you apply this kind of thing? I feel like you can apply this kind of thing to entrepreneurship, but how in just a nutshell? Right, right. So, um, so there will be people who do something very similar to what you do as an entrepreneur, but just slightly different. And, and um, there's often this tendency that we think that they're our competitors and we want to stay away. And, but um, if you think that you know, we all have a unique niche and we're doing something slightly different, the word I'll, I'll give you is coopetition. So find out who's your coopetition that is something so similar but slightly different um, and you're in a similar space so you really can sponsor each other. So, you know, I'm a, a business owner and entrepreneur um, but a lot of my opportunities come from other people who do something very similar but slightly a little off what I do. Um, and then also immerse yourself in who your customer base or client base will be because some of your greatest sponsors will be fanatical customers who, who love you and love your work or your product and introduce you and just open doors and make a whole world possible. Does that answer your question? Right, good, good. And the same is true if you're a student or uh, you know, you're in faculty. You don't have to be in the corporate world to have a sponsor. Absolutely. And with that, let's please thank our speaker. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. So as part, oh, you don't get to go yet. Just one second. As part of thanking you, we have this talking stick. Oh, wow. And it was created by uh, Jim Yelton, an artist from the Coast Salish Nation, where the eagle is a symbol of great strength and leadership. Ah, leadership. Good fit. Yes. Thank you very much. Thank Joe. you. This, this is beautiful. Beautiful object. Thank you. And I'm going to let Joe sit down just because I want to take a moment to say, uh, obviously, we wanted to thank her and give her this gift. But also, we'd really like to take this moment, because it is our last speaker, to thank again all of the colloquium sponsors who really made this phenomenal lineup of seven speakers possible. So the president's office, obviously, as well as the Department of Graduate and Postdoctoral Studies, our Vice President of Research, thank you, Dr. Joy Johnson. She's going to actually close this, but definitely she's getting applause when she stands up. <laughs> no pressure, everybody, but they're doing that. Um, SFU's Key Big Data Initiative, as well as the Natural Sciences and Engineering Research Council. Tableau, who's in the audience with us tonight, thank you as a corporate sponsor. We really appreciated that. The Faculty of Applied Sciences at SFU, as well as the School of Computing Science and it's a bit of a self-plug, but actually our chair program, the West Coast Women in Engineering Science and Technology program, also sponsored this event because we really wanted this to go forward. So thank you all the sponsors for supporting the entire colloquium series. And please, after uh, Dr. Johnson's had this opportunity to really close off the session, enjoy this reception in the foyer. We have lots of food. You can't leave until you eat it. No pressure. Thank you. Um, I'm going to keep my remarks brief um, because there is food to be eaten. Um, but first of all, I really want to thank um, the speaker as well. I really uh, appreciated your comments and certainly took notes. Um, I think we all need sponsors and we all need to sponsor people. And um, I learned a lot. So thank you very, very much. Um, the President's Dream Colloquium is really important to the university because it's an opportunity to bring great speakers to the university. Uh, it's a part, an opportunity to really engage students on, the, on a topic that they might not be able to engage in otherwise. And it's also an opportunity um, for interdisciplinary thinking, to bring a group together who haven't really thought together uh, in, in this particular way. So I think there's a little bit of magic at SFU um, through the President's Dream Colloquium. Um, and I'm always amazed at um, how the topics are so, so fascinating and, and how much gets done um, through this process. I would say that this President's Dream Colloquium has been particularly exciting. And for me, as a woman in leadership, I've been just thrilled to see this work happening. And I want to give a particular shout out to, to Leslie for the work that she's done. 
Uh, she really is a leader for all of us. Um, I want you to be my mentor. Um, no, you really, you've done an amazing job um, pulling together a great group of faculty. I know that there's been others involved in we as well, and I want to recognize that there's been an, a number of faculty involved in this process. Um, but you really, you've been the champion, and you've had a lot of help as well, and I really want to recognize the whole team for the work that's been put together um, for this colloquium. I also want to say that um, this is a really important time for us to be talking about this issue. We have a Minister of Science here in Canada who is talking about issues of equity and women in science. We have a university right now who's in the midst of developing new equity plans to make sure that we're thinking about opportunities for women across the university. And so uh, I'm certainly going to be checking out all of the materials that come out of this colloquium. I'm going to be encouraging my colleagues at the executive table to be turning to the experts who've really put this material together so that we as a university can do better. I know there's a lot of work for us to do, um, but I'm certain that um, this is really going to be a lasting legacy for all of us. Uh, our president, Andrew Petter, would have liked to be here tonight, but he is unable to be here. Um, so I got to draw the long straw and, uh, and come. And I really want to thank all of you for participating. Uh, it really has been a great journey together. Um, and I want to, uh, again, thank um, the organizers for putting this together. I'm really very, very grateful. So on behalf of the university, thank you very much. So there is food to be eaten, so please enjoy. And I, I really appreciate the speaker as well, hanging out with us and um, answering more questions. So thank you.